Good morning. Good morning. You don't need the mic on yet. Okay. Uh, last week we started a new theme, or maybe we started thinking that of um, But I'm asking people to, if they would be willing to come up and share their testimony. I think that's something that we need to hear. We need to encourage one another with what God has done in our lives. Last week I bit the bullet and I went first. Uh, this week I've asked Vivian if she would be Vivian. <laughs> oh, there you are. Was, she, she bailed on me. <laughs> she was sitting right there. I've asked Vivian if she would come up. Um, I told her to take as much time as she needs. So I just asked that you would uh, give heed to life lessons. And uh, Vivian, if you would. You want me to adjust the mic for you? Hello. I had gotten pregnant, and the baby saved my life. My parents uh, took care of me. I was not allowed to hide in our little town. It was the early 50s. And uh, you tried to hide your shame. But I was not allowed to do that. I was sent to the store and the post office, and all over the town, before the neighbors. The whole town knew my history, and uh, <coughs> my parents accepted their prodigal home. 
uh, and behaved as Christians before the town. They held their heads up and they insisted that I do too and that I do what I was supposed to do. I went to the altar uh, of our church at 17 and uh, I wrote to Smokey about it. He'd been enlisted in the Marines and sent to Korea. And uh, he came home on May the 5th, 1952, and we were married on May the 10th. There was quite a write-up in the paper. You would have thought all would begin to be better, but... Uh, my husband was a drinker, and so I learned to party with him. Uh, Bunny was born on the Marine base in California. And, uh, my husband was discharged in 1953. And, uh, we moved home and he became a logger. And, uh, our small town uh, <clears throat> became our life. Playing around on Saturday night and not going to church anymore. I didn't. I slid way away. But my parents continued to pray for us. Eventually, we have seven children and uh, moved to Montana following the jobs. Uh, we struggled. It was so hard. I knew my mother had direct line to God, and uh, so I called her every time uh, trouble moved, and it did a lot, every day. And I wrote and told her everything. And they prayed. In 1982, my dad died. That was my first dealing with death. We brought mother over here to stay with us after, after dad passed away. And uh, after all seven of our children were married and on their own, it was our time now, so uh, we thought we had it made then. Smokey got colon cancer and he died. 1991. Uh, that winter was the darkest time of my life. At some point, I went out to Teresa and Brad's in Oak Harbor and they took me to church with them, a four square church. And uh, their pastor came to the steps with open arms to welcome me. And it might have well have been Jesus himself because I was home again. When I came back to uh, Stevensville, I, I found a four-square church in Hamilton, and so I went there for a time. And until Mother had to, was in the nursing home, and she needed to be fed every day at noon, so I started coming here to this church, and it's been my home ever since. Uh, my parents were prayer warriors all of their lives, and they witnessed and testified in that town all their married life, 52 years. They didn't have many others to fellowship with there. It was a mill town. But one by one, here and there, a neighbor and a friend, and they ministered to them and witnessed to them. There's now a statue in front of City Hall donated by my cousin, who they helped, too. And the plaque says, in memory of Gary and Archie Baldridge, and their prayers are still being answered. They've been in heaven a long time. My prayer list is long. Out of here. It's almost wore out. And if you're here, you're on it. So. 
I hope my story isn't an indication of yours, but we all have so much in our background that we wish we didn't have there. The Holy Spirit is my best companion. And I've never been alone. He helps me with everything. He helped me fix my hair this morning before I came to church. And you could ask him for anything. And he will help you. Gladly. This isn't really my testament. It's the testament of his faithfulness and his patience. And his forgiveness. I'll be 80 years old soon. This has been a painful memory for me. Remembering where I came from. The pit I dug for myself was a deep one. But God brought me straight out of it. And here I am. I love you guys.
We're going to talk about some things today. And yes, it is. So we are in chapter one. Last week, we talked a little bit about uh, Epiphras. And I challenged you, do you have what it takes to be an Epiphras? And, you know, Epiphras is one of the unsung heroes of God's Word. And we only have about four verses written about him. You know, we know a lot about Paul, we know a lot about Peter, John, James. Um, you know, we, we know a lot about a lot of the people in the New Testament. But there's a lot of people in the New Testament we don't know a lot about. Epiphras is one of them. If you want more information, you have to look it up on the internet. Or check out the DVD or the CD from the library. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about the past today. But we're working our way through. And I'm going to just read a passage. I'm going to end up here in verse 8. Um, I'm starting in verse 3. Because I want you to get the flow for where I'm at. Okay? We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it, and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epiphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. About 3.30 this morning, I woke up, I was feeling a little off, and I thought, well, I, I better go check my sugar. But yesterday was kind of weird. My eating was kind of weird. I went to check my sugar. And those of you that are my fellow diabetics, I was 47. I thought, hmm, I should probably do something about that. <laughs> now, I don't know about the rest of you, but there's a lot of diabetics in here. Okay? So you guys understand what I'm saying. But sometimes when my sugar gets low, I get confused. So if you ever see me confused, ask me where my sugar's at. Sometimes it has nothing to do with my sugar. <laughs> um, well, I was sitting at my desk and checking my sugar, and I saw what it was, and I started thinking about today's message. I started panicking because of having just gone over it Thursday in men's group. I'm thinking, okay, God, did I miss it? Maybe I should be preaching on something else. And I opened up, uh, the computer was on, so I opened it up, and I was looking over my notes, and I was thinking, gosh, this is just about everything that we talked about on Thursday. And I, I just started praying. I said, God, did I miss it? Did I make a mistake? Because it just seems kind of silly that I'm repeating what we went over Thursday. And the more I prayed, the more I just felt like God said, no, I want you to, I want you to do just what I've got for you. So the verse that we're working on is verse 8. It says, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now, the first thing that popped into my mind when I read this is your love in the Spirit why does he specify in the Spirit? My take on it is there's nothing in this word that's in there accidentally. There's nothing in there that's a mistake. So when he said, you're loving the Spirit, there's a reason for it. Now, I think I've got a simple answer. Okay? I kind of subscribe to Occam's razor, Occam's theory, that the simplest answer is usually the most likely the correct answer. Sometimes that doesn't work, like algebra. <laughs> calculus and stuff. Um, but oftentimes it, it really is where things are found. I think he's saying, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. I think he's separating it from um, merely, mere fleshly attempts to love. Um, you know, the, the Beatles sang that song, All You Need Is Love? That's cockamamie. Because if all you've got is love that you can give to other people, it's a pretty shallow, self-centered thing. So when, when Paul is specifying your love in the Spirit, I think he's qualifying what this love is. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little history in Greek. Some of you, you, you probably already know this. There are four words in the Greek that can be translated love. Okay? Three of them are used in Scripture. Okay? Now, you guys know agape? Agapeo? Okay. What is that? Unconditional love. Unconditional love. It's the love without qualification. It's not measured. Okay? This is almost always used in how we are to love 
and how God loves us. Okay? Now there's, there's a second type of love, and this one is eros. Does anyone know what eros means? Romantic love. Romantic love. The, 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 the physical appeal that you have when you first meet your spouse, and that hopefully carries on with your spouse, that, that's eros. It's where we get the word erotic. What appeals to the eye, appeals to the senses. Okay? That word is not in Scripture. Okay? It's not there. Third word is phileo, or phileo. Now, does anybody, does that word sound familiar to anyone? I'll give you a hint. City. Philadelphia. What is Philadelphia known as? City of brotherly love. Phileo is the, the, the love that you have for brother. Okay? It, it's kind of a, a, a phileo type relationship. Okay? Um, not carnal necessarily. Could be. But it, it really carries it with the connotation of buddy. Okay? Somebody you want to be with. You're comfortable being with. Okay? Now, the fourth word, and this one is only used um, three times that I was able to find in Scripture. Twice it was used in a negative connotation, meaning unloved or unlovely. Okay? The, the, the word is uh, storge. The one time that it is used where it is not negative, it's actually used in conjunction with phileo, and it's translated brotherly love. Okay? And that's the only time that we have those, those, that word, is three times. Twice saying unlovely or unloved, unlovable, and it's talking about, um, both passages are talking about in the end times when people will, will be, they won't love. The love that they have is not love. Okay? And the one time that it does use it is it's, it's, it's like saying, um, deal with each other in love, love. Okay? And it, it literally means, the, it carries with it the idea of obligatory love. Okay? Like a mother loves her child. Not that you're obliged to love your child, but somehow or another you always do even when they're being unruly. You still love them. Boy, I saw a lot of looks right over here. <laughs> <laughs> but it carries it with the idea of the love that comes from a relationship. It's, it's just there. Okay? So, of the four types of love, what do you suppose Paul is using right here? He says... He has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Agape. Agape. Agapeo. He is saying the unqualified, unconditional love in the Spirit. I think he's using in the Spirit to reiterate this unconditional love. Because it's something that can't come from you, of your own. We don't have the ability in and of ourselves to love unconditionally. Why? Because we're self-centered. Everything tends to revolve around us. Now, you understand the difference between self-centered and selfish? <coughs> okay? Titus, my two-year-old grandson, is self-centered. A lot of times that plays out by being selfish. Okay? He's egocentric, which means everything revolves around him. He doesn't understand, if I want it, why I should not have it. He doesn't understand, if I have it, why should I share it? Okay? We see that exhibited in toddlers and, and sometimes teenagers and a lot of times in adults. <laughs> it, it's, it's egocentric. It is self-centered. A lot of times it plays out being selfish. Because all that you understand is me. When you have agape love, it denies yourself. Because you have to lay yourself down to minister to the needs of the other person. Oftentimes to your own inconvenience, to your own detriment. Okay? Agape love, I can show you kind of a demonstration of this, although this, this kind of comes on, on store day. <clears throat> when your child is sick at 3 o'clock in the morning and in the bathroom heaving all over everywhere, and there's a trail running from the bathroom to the bed where they started, that's the kind of love that gets the mom out of bed 
and ministers to the child and makes sure they're okay, and then cleans up the trail and the bed so that she doesn't have two trails to deal with it when her husband sees it. Okay? Because I don't do throw them. That's, you know, there's only been one time that I remember clearly that Christy was not home one of the children had that kind of issue. And I, I had to go like this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's the kind of love that is agape. Now, when you are willing to sacrifice your sleep, your needs, your ministration, to minister to others in their need, you're approaching agape. Okay? Jesus says that no greater love does anyone have but that he lay down his life for his friend. Wow. You know, being a man, most men are geared with the thought, yeah, I take the bullet. My wife and my children are in danger? You betcha. I take the bullet. I hope to God in that situation I would carry through. Actually, I hope I'm smart enough to look, chunk a table at them. <laughs> let the, book, the table take the bullet. But do we really? Because see, it's not just a matter of taking the bullet. It's laying down your life Meaning that you will become a servant to the needs of the other. And we go, oh yeah, I'll take the bullet for you. Give me a cup of coffee. When's dinner? How come the TV's dirty? See, laying down your life for your brother isn't just being willing to die for them. That doesn't give you an out for your life. It's not just that last moment of your life. It's the entirety of your life. So when you lay down your life, it's giving up your rights, your privileges, to being you to minister to the need of others. Okay? So when we understand that, we start to approach agape. The love that God has. Now, think about it like this. What isn't God's? So it's all his, right? If it's his, does he get to do with it what he wants? Pretty much. You know? Um, I got a TV at home. Yeah, and, okay, I got a confession. I do, I do. But this isn't my fault. Okay? You remember about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I was talking about flat screen TVs? Remember that? And I was saying how, you know, I don't need a flat screen TV. My TV works just fine. My parents didn't think my TV worked just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Christopher and Kayla show up uh, like the night before they were going to leave. And Christopher's lugging in a flat screen TV. I was like, what is that? Well, Dad, it's a flat screen TV. Okay. Let's rephrase. Why is that here? Well, my mom and dad weren't content with my TV. They thought I needed a different TV. So now i got to get used to people being wide. <laughs> it's, it's, I got used to them being purple, white, purple. Now i got to get used to them being wide. Okay, yeah. So i, I, I got a confession. i got, I got, a, I got a flat screen TV now. I feel like a sinner. <laughs> I could, I'm serious, I could, when they walked in and my mom told me what she did, I was like... <laughs> you realize about two weeks ago I just talked about this whole thing? I think God was just, just trying to get at me saying, yeah, your, your arrogance is useless. <laughs> so, but I've got a TV. Now, I can choose to turn the TV on. I can choose to turn the TV off. I can choose to change the channel. I can choose to watch a movie. I, I, my TV, I can do it. If I, if I want, I can take it outside and throw a rock at it. I ain't going to. <laughs> Not at this point. <laughs> but it's my TV. I get to do with it what I want, right? Right? Right. It's mine. So if everything is God's, doesn't he get to do whatever he wants with it? Why in the world do you get to choose anything? Ah. See, agape is the unqualified, unconditional love that God bears for his children. Now, I've heard people say, you know, why would God give people a choice so that they could choose wrong and go to hell? 
because I believe that God desires a sincere, heartfelt love rather than a required love. You ever tried to force your child to love you? It's like the harder you push, the more they resist. You know, God wants a sincere, heartfelt love. He wants people that will choose to embrace Him and His way. Remember what He says in the Old Testament? Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. You choose. Who are you going to serve? And He even listed things, you know, uh, He took them before the mountains and He said, okay, on the one hand, you have the mountain of blessing. And here's what happens if you do what I tell you to do. Now, is God doing that because he's a power monger? No, because he understands how the equipment was designed to operate. He understands how we're designed to work and what makes us work best. Steve, how long does a car last without oil? But by golly, it's my car, and I don't want it to have oil. And there it sits in my, car, in my driveway, and I'm working. Okay, so if I understand how it's supposed to operate, wouldn't I be the best one to tell you how it operates? That's the same thing with God. He understands how it works best. Now, on the other side, and you know what, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to go this way because I don't want you guys to feel like you're the cursings. <laughs> the other side is the mountain of cursings. Now, is God putting curses on them because they've offended him? You betcha. Is that God's right? You betcha. It's all his. What does Paul tell us? What does the clay get to say to the potter? What would you make of me? Isn't it the potter's will? Yeah. Okay. But is he doing it because he delights in cursing us? Absolutely not. Because see, when you don't do it his way, you break it. The machinery breaks down. And this is a result of the machinery breaking down. You know what the mileage is on my car that I don't put oil in? Zero. Because it don't go nowhere. Okay. So, this is his right to do as he wills, but he chooses to agape, agapeo, us. Now, welcome to the intro. Okay, see, this is the measure. This is the measure. Now, there's a couple things that I'm going to talk to you about today. Because, see... God has required this same love of us. This is the love that God expects of us. <coughs> um, we went in John, last week in, in men's group, we were in John chapter 13. So if you would flip over there real quick. John chapter 13. Actually, just hold that for just a second. I'm going to read you another passage. Don't bother turning there. I'll just read it to you. Um, Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is, is talking to one of the Pharisees. And he says, God's two greatest commandments are to love. It says, teacher, this is, this is the, the Pharisee asking him. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Okay, so check this out. See that? All of this hinges on those two commandments. You know Cliff's Notes? That's like super Cliff's Notes right there. <laughs> All of this hinges on love God with everything you got and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay? So we have a commandment there that requires us to love our neighbor. Well, looking back over here in John, 
I, I want to read you something. This kind of gives us a little bit of a dilemma. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, what kind of love is he talking about? <laughs> nope. Agapeo. Unconditional. Unqualified. But check this out. He says, a new commandment. Well, wait a minute. We just read in Matthew, quoting from the Old Testament, the, the first commandment is to love God. The second one is to love your neighbor. Aren't we already required to love our... Why is this a new commandment? Why does he say I'm giving you a new commandment to something that he's already told us? It's already recorded in God's Word. Check out the condition that he puts on this. Okay? He says that you love one another just as I have loved you. Okay? See, the bar has been raised to heights of infinity. Okay? Whereas before, they'd say, oh, okay, i got to love them like I love myself. Well, today I'm not feeling too good about myself, so you're in trouble. <laughs> love is short rations today. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You guys better watch out. My love is minimal today because I ain't feeling too loved. All right? Now, remember, in the New Testament, Jesus brought us truth to everything that was in the Old Testament. A lot of what was written in the Old Testament is absolute truth, but we misunderstood it. The Jews misunderstood it and they misapplied it. Okay? Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, uh, you've heard it said, you know, don't commit murder. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you hate your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. You're guilty before God. That's sin. Okay? You've also heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you the truth, if you look lustfully at a woman, you have already committed adultery. See, Jesus didn't come and make things easier in the attainment of the law. If you're trying to attain the law, you're in trouble. Because he made it harder. Because now it's not just about what you do, it's about what you think and what you are. You're in trouble. So if you're trying to obtain God's favor... Through fulfilling the law, looking at the New Testament, Jesus didn't make it easier. He made it harder. But it's not just about 12 commandments. It's about who you are. Ten commandments. I don't know where the extra two came from. <laughs> I, think it, I think it started the Talmud. Okay? So we have ten in the Old Testament, but Jesus says it's not just the actions. It's your heart. It's the condition of your heart. All right? So, in the same way, the Old Testament tells us, you've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus says, you don't got to love them like you love yourself. You've got to love them like I love you. Wow. Now, Jesus did lay down his life for his friends. Because remember, he said, I don't call you disciples. I call you friends. He did lay down his life. But look at the ministry that he had. Time and time and time again, putting his own needs aside. Ministry, healing people through the course of the night and then getting up early in the morning to go off by himself to pray, to recharge, to regenerate, to have fellowship with his father. And the disciples pop up and they're like, hey, whoa, where, where do you, where'd he go? Go get him. We got people that need to be served here. And they, they went up and got him. What did Jesus do? No, I need my alone time. I need me time. What did he do? He said, you're right. You know what? Let's move on to the next town. We can proclaim the message in the entire area. That's what we're here to do. Okay? See, this is laying down your life for your friend. When your friend is in need and your favorite TV show is on and you don't have TiVo or whatever they have today. I don't even know if they have TiVo anymore. Are you willing to miss that show? All right, let's, let's make it even more important. Game 7, Stanley Cup Finals. <laughs> Colorado Avalanche, New Jersey Devils. <laughs> Series tied, three apiece. Game's ready to start. All right, I know I'm the only one here besides Christopher that is even into this. And that is. All right, Super Bowl. <coughs> Super Bowl. Your team has made it. They've come all the way up. 
All right, Super Bowl. Are you willing to put that aside to help your brother? Are you willing? Okay. Are we willing to set that aside? Or are we going to be egocentric? Are we going to remain in the world revolving around us? See, that's what I'm talking about. That's what he's talking about here. Okay? So, the bar has been set. It's no longer about loving them like we love ourselves. It's loving them as Christ has loved them. But did you catch what this says? Right here, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. <coughs> See, there should never be a question to anybody's mind as to whether or not you're a Christian. Francis of Assisi said, uh, love always, if necessary, use words. I agree and I disagree. I agree because our lifestyle should be such that Christianity just exudes out from us. From our every action. I disagree in that he's told us we need to use words. Just make sure that your words line up with your actions. Don't tell people how they need to be in church on Sunday while you're at the bar on Friday. Is there anything wrong with going to the bar? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to the bar. I think you need to be very careful about going to the bar. Okay? Because you could be a stumbling block. Going to the bar wrong could be for you. Could very well be for you. There is sin that is personal. Okay? So, if it's wrong for you, stay away. But I tell you what, if you go in there as a mission field, first I would caution you, <laughs> understand what they're there for. They're not, a, they're not there to be ministered by spirit, they're to be ministered by spirits. <laughs> okay? Okay? And second, don't get dragged in. So, if you are living a lifestyle that you're friends with them in the bar on Friday, and then you invite them to church on Sunday, and they show up on Sunday, and the dude that they were at the bar on Friday is not the dude that's sitting in the pew on Sunday, shut up. Okay? Get your life in line with what God wants of you, then the power of your verbal testimony, man, it's got credence. It's got value. It's got testimony. Okay? By this, they will know that you're my disciples, that you have unconditional love one for another, that you love each other without qualifications. Even when I do stupid things, I say things wrong. I have a fit of peak. You gotta love me. You gotta be willing to forgive me. Sometimes you might even need to admonish me. Hey, uh, what's going on with this? Check this, okay? Well, we gotta do that with each other, right? Look, don't put me on a pedestal. First, I don't like heights. Okay? Second, you're going to disappoint everybody. If I fall down just standing on the ground, you put me up on a pedestal, that's just a long way further for me to fall. Don't put each other up on pedestals. Understand we're all in this together. The same pit that God rescued Vivian from is the same pit that he's rescued you from. She might have been in a different locale in the pit. Scenery might have looked a little bit different, but it's the same pit. We all came out of the same pit by the same grace because of his love. Okay? So, if we are to be known as his disciples, we've got to have this. If it surprises someone that you're a Christian, I would challenge you, re-examine how you're living your life. Okay? Do you have unqualified love or do you have egocentric love? Is it based on what you're going to get rather than what you can get? One other thing I want to share with you. Now, this, this is, don't get all excited. We're not wrapping up yet. Because we're going to flip over to 1 Corinthians 13. Because see, this is, this is something that I find really cool. Anybody know what 1 Corinthians 13 is? The love chapter. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> 
See, keep in mind, the four types of love that we talked about, only one of them can fulfill all of this. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, do you ever find that where the, the location of this passage to be kind of weird? Because, see, 1 Corinthians 12, we deal with spiritual gifts. And 1 Corinthians 14, we're dealing with spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 13, we're dealing with spiritual love. The love that we have for us in the Spirit. Okay? So let's, let's look at this real quick. He's qualifying. Are we starting? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels that have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic power and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have not, and if I have faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. See, listen, spiritual gifts are not going to get you into heaven. They're not going to get you into heaven. Go back, look at Matthew 7, look at Matthew 24, 25. Okay, when Jesus is separating out the sheep and the goats, look at what those people were doing. They were they had all kinds of spiritual gifts. They didn't know. So then in verse 4 he goes, this is, this is where we need to pay attention. Okay, now listen to me. I'm going to use a quote that Christy has quoted in her women's Bible study. Christy, how's it go? Not perfectly, just increasingly. Not perfectly, increasingly. Okay? Here is what we are ascribing to. Love is patient, <clears throat> kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. <coughs> Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures <coughs> all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I did a little study and some calculations. How many times do you suppose pray is used in the Bible? Anybody? All the different possible words for pray used about 120 times in the Bible. 120 times. How about faith? What would you say faith is? How many? 500? It's about 270. 270 times throughout the Old and New Testament. Now, joy. What would you think about joy? Because these are all core tenets to our faith, aren't they? To being a Christian, right? So how, what would you say joy was? 50? About 220. What about love? 5,000. 5,000. <laughs> Used about 540 times. Okay? Now, we talk about faith. Faith is required unto salvation. Money. We talk about money. You know, I even pay the book money. But I didn't write it down. Darn. 
Because that's, that's another one that'll shock you. That'll shock you. Now, often the Bible talks about money. We talk about faith, we talk about joy, we talk about praying. All of those things necessary for a true believer. But the one that God spends the most time talking to us about is love. Love. <coughs> so I would challenge you. Spend this week. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Look at it honestly. Don't look at it through qualifications. Well, I would have done better there if they weren't such a jerk. <laughs> uh, I, I think that was okay. Look at it in light of the bar that is set by being his disciple. Are you loving as he has loved? That's the measure. Okay? So we look at these things and we go, okay, is the love that I have patient and kind? I can tell you right now, a lot of times my love is very impatient. I am very egocentric. A lot of times, the way that I act, I'm, I'm oblivious to my wife and children's needs. I, I just don't even... I did what? Why, why would that hurt you? Ignorance, stupidity. Okay? Egocentric. All right? Does it envy or boast? Is it arrogant? Uh, I love good. <laughs> that just seems weird to me. Okay? But well, we have that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Right? It's not rude. Okay, now this next one kills me. It does not insist on its own way. How many perfectionists do we have here? How many like things done right? Okay, so you guys know what this means. Okay, do you share with me the pain of this? Because see, in a perfectionist mind, there is a right way to do it. And any other way is not right. And since I'm the only one that knows the right way to do it, it has to be done my way. Right? Okay. Now, for a non-perfectionist, you don't understand that. But when I read this, does not insist on its own way. That, that gets me right there, because I, I am very guilty of that. Okay? It is not irritable or resentful. You know, you're not entitled to bad days. Now, you're going to have bad days. But that does not entitle you to selfishness, irritability, moodiness. I don't care about your hormones. Um, women, I'm not just talking to you. But men, you got hormones too. That whole testosterone thing, when the guy cuts you off on the road, you know, that, that rage, that's testosterone. That's a hormone. That's a hormonal reaction. All right? Those do not entitle you to being cranky. Okay. It's not resentful. That's another one I struggle with. My wife is my wife. Everybody else comes like, there's not even a second or a third or a fourth. My wife should be with me. And it, was, it took me a long time. See, I know. See, I'm giving you all kinds of fodder to keep me off of that pillar. <laughs> okay? But it took me a long time to be gracious in letting her go to lunch with her friends. Well, you're going to go to lunch? Why don't you go to lunch with me? <laughs> what, am I not good enough? I don't do childbirth stories. <laughs> I don't do them. All right? Maybe the next time Christy goes to lunch with her friend, you and I will go. <laughs> but there are things that women can minister to Christy to that I cannot. There are things that she can share at liberty with them that she just can't share with you because I go, 
<laughs> That's weird. I just don't like you to tell them the things that they probably do are weird. Okay? And I'm learning that. All right? I'm learning that. A lot of times it comes out, that's me. But she gives me the book. Okay? But resentful. Okay? It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. All right. Listen to me. When you're in an argument, for the sake of winning the argument, not for the sake of truth, but for the sake of winning the argument, and it's a win-at-all-costs mentality, you're rejoicing in wrongdoing. Okay? You're rejoicing in wrongdoing. When you get to the end of that argument, and they finally give up in defeat, and you go, yes, four for me. <laughs> You're rejoicing in wrongdoing. That is not love. It rejoices with the truth. Now this next one, I'm going to wrap up with this. Love bears all things. Love bears all things. It doesn't qualify this. It believes all things. Doesn't qualify this. Someone tells you a lie, yeah, they told you a lie. We operate in that they're speaking us the truth. I've seen so many people get burned. Well, I don't, I don't believe anything that person says. Listen, you're not showing love. Yeah, we are as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. In your endeavor for the truth, do not stumble over their inability to the truth. Okay? <coughs> it hopes all things. Listen, parents of children that are not saved. Hopes all things. Those loved ones that we have that are not walking with God, we hope all things. Endures all things. See, this passage right here eliminates any cause for divorce, ever. Do you understand that? Love bears all things, unqualified. Believes all things, unqualified. Hopes all things, unqualified. Endures all things, unqualified. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you may not need help in your marriage. I'm not even saying there may not be a time that separation may be necessary. I'm not talking about that. And I know I will probably offend some of you and you go, well, what about abuse? Would that fall in the all things? Is abuse in all things? Is there hope all things? Don't get me wrong. I despise abuse. You want to get me going, let me see somebody shake up one of their kids. I don't have a problem swapping them on the butt. I'll tell you what, when Christopher was in football, one of the fathers that was helping coach a team was not happy with how one of the kids was playing. He walked out grabbed by the home and started shaking his helmet. I almost had him on the ground before I realized I left the sidelines. I have no respect for abuse. So don't get me wrong. What I'm saying, I'm not saying like <coughs> But if we believe God's word is truth, then love will endure all things. Get help. Absolutely get help. Absolutely get help. Get intervention. If necessary for a time, separation. But it should always be working back to the restoration. Don't take the easy way out. You trust in God. That's hopes all things. We trust in God because He can do all things. If He can take a sinner like me, a sinner like Vivi, and make the changes in us that He has made over the course of our lives, don't you think He can take an abusive husband or an abusive father or an abusive mother or an abusive wife and 
change them mm -hmm. to his glory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. See, this is the kind of love that we're being called to. The bar has been set. Are you willing to step up? To set aside, hey, Phileo's great. Phileo is great, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Phileo may even take the bullet for you, but Phileo is not going to put aside the Super Bowl for you. Agape. We love as he has loved us. That's how the world knows we are his. That's how the world knows we are his. Amen? Amen.